this is the Fiqh and Fatwa, Modern Problems, Timeless Solutions session. Uh, you know, as we know as Muslims, it's, it's not enough that we utter the Shahada or we believe in Islam. It's not an abstract set of ideas we agree to, but in every action we are constantly reminding ourselves that, you know, this is our relationship with Allah Ta'ala. And as, as those who study Fiqh know, there's, it's a very detail-oriented science and actions are not divorced from philosophical beliefs, but they're, they're rather intertwined. Today's session, inshallah, will explore, you know, as societies evolve, new issues arise requiring contemporary interpretations of Islamic law, it is essential to adapt while maintaining the core principles of Islam. So how does the system of fiqh and how do fatawa work uh, within the Islamic system? Uh, for today's talk, we have two esteemed speakers. In order of presentation, we have Sheikh Suhail Mullah. Sheikh Suhail Mullah is the director of the Los Angeles branch of the Khalil Center. It's a community spiritual and psychological wellness center. Uh, Sheikh Suhail also currently serves as the resident scholar at the Islamic Society of West Valley. He also serves as the IOK Muslim chaplain at both UCLA and California, Cal State uh, Northridge. Additionally, he also serves as a religious advisor to Ummah Community Clinic. Um, when he's not doing all the aforementioned things, he's also a co-founder of the Muslim Marriage Rejuvenation Retreat. Uh, Sheikh Suhail has worked as a social worker in the uh, LAUSD, or the Los Angeles uh, School District, and Silmar Juvenile Court. He has served as an imam at ISOC and, and as an interim executive director and director of mental health at Access California Services. Sheikh Suhail earned his bachelor's degree in African American Studies from CSUN, his master's in social welfare from UCLA, and another bachelor's, uh, bachelor's degree in Sharia from Azhar al-Sharif. Our second speaker is Sheikh Mustafa Omar. Sheikh Mustafa Omar completed his bachelor's in information and computer science from University of California, Irvine, as well as a bachelor's in theology and Islamic law from the European Institute of Islamic Sciences in France. After that, he had a master's of arts in Islamic studies from the University of Gloucestershire, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, uh, in the UK. He also studied the Islamic sciences for a year at Nadwatul Ulama in Lucknow, India, and spent another year studying in Cairo, Egypt. Mustafa Umar later completed the traditional iftat program at Darul Iftat, Birmingham, UK, uh, granting him the traditional title of Mufti or Specialist in Islamic Law. So without further ado, I will invite Sheikh Suhail Mullah to conduct the first part of the session, followed by Sheikh Mustafa Umar, and inshallah we should have some time for Q&A afterwards. Assalamu alaikum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم بسم الله so mashallah nice to be with you all here at this opening I guess one of the opening sessions at the mass convention and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, put barakah in this weekend and make it a beneficial gathering for all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ سُورَةُ النَّحْلِ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that we have sent down upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-dhikr, al-Qur'an, that you may clarify to the people that which has been revealed and that they may contemplate. And so an essential function and part of our deen is understanding our deen, an essential part of us living as Muslims, navigating life, dealing with everyday, uh, you know, um, scenarios, is our responsibility as Muslims trying to live those everyday life scenarios the way in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants us to live in this world, and so the Quran is of course our source book, is our ultimate guide. But then, wait a second, how do I 
translate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me as far as general guidelines, as far as overarching directives, as far as guiding life principles, but then translate that into my everyday affairs where there may not be specific questions or answers that are there that tell me one, two, three, what to do in every aspect of my life. And so the, the scholars throughout history have carved out a path for us to follow as to navigate this reality. And of course, that all starts from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you see again and again and again in the Qur'an, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Yas'alunak, they ask you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yas'alunak anil mahil, they ask you about the menstrual cycle, Yas'alunak anil khamri wal maysir, they ask you about uh, um, uh, alcohol and gambling, Yas'alunak anil mahilla, they ask you about the stages of the moon and so forth. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would be asked, and oftentimes, the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't have the answers. And so Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reveals the Qur'an so that the Prophet Sallallahu can then guide people as to navigate X, Y, Z. Why is it important for us as Muslims to understand how we need to navigate every single different aspect of our life? First of all, and, and backing up a little bit, Islam is a comprehensive system, a comprehensive way of life that is applicable to all time and all place. To every single corner of this world where there are completely different cultural realities and cultural iterations of how people live their lives. And across the ages, every single generation, Islam is here to provide guidance. صَالِحٌ لِكُلِّ زَمَانٍ وَمَكَانٍ That's the beauty of our deen. It's not a restricted reality that sat in a certain part of, of you know, human history and then it's static. It is something that is vibrant, is dynamic, and is there for, our, for us to, you know, to extract and to deduct understandings even though there are certain things that didn't exist at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but then uh, we have these general guiding principles that the Qur'an and the Sunnah give us so as to navigate life. And so they would come to the Prophet Wasallam. they would ask him questions. Oftentimes he didn't know. And he would, they would ask him to answer and he would say, I don't know, I can't tell you the answer. And he would wait for the wahi to come before he would give the answer. And then, and then when the Sahaba, they had questions, they had this reference point of the Prophet ﷺ. There were some times when the Sahaba, they would make fatwa, when they would make a, a, uh, you know, a verdict that they would seek on their own to try to apply what knowledge they had, which was perhaps limited in terms of helping people in their affairs. The Prophet ﷺ was the main reference and there were times when the Sahaba, they would answer questions and they would err in their way to the point there was this one incident that happened when there was a man and they were out uh, on an expedition. The Sahaba were out on an expedition and one of the Sahaba, he had to make, he had a wet dream at night and he had to make ghusl. And it's freezing. And so he asked the Sahaba, well, what should I do? They said, well, you have to make ghusl. There's no other option. And he did. He had a, and he had a wound in his head. He had a gash in his head. He was injured from the, from one of the, from the excursion that they had just went on. And so he made ghusl in the freezing cold night with the cold water, and he died. And they go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he got upset. He said, Qatalu, uh, qatalahumullah. He says that they killed him. You all have killed him with this verdict by giving him this, under, by, you know, uh, uh, putting this, uh, this particular opinion upon him 
you killed him. And so the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba were very keen about going to him and seeking, and the, 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 the big Sahaba, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali, they all understood that and they would go back to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ, he leaves this world, the Sahaba, they were such a people that they were very hesitant to give fatwa. And what is fatwa? Fatwa is giving people an understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will is for any given situation or scenario. And that's why it was such a scary reality to the Sahaba. I'm speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm afraid to do that. To the point where one of the tabi'een, the generation after the Sahaba, said, I met 120 of the Sahaba. And they were all afraid to, give, to pass judgment, to give me an opinion on a matter. And they would ask the next person, uh, the, the person next to them and they would take it to the next person they would all deflect they wouldn't answer the question until it would come back all the way around to the first person like they were they were so hesitant they, they were afraid of speaking on that which they did not know unfortunately we live in a time you know where people are ready to tell you this is halal and this is haram and they have such limited understanding, but yet they have such audacity to speak in such a way, although we see the Sahaba were completely different. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, years ago, uh, when I first started being active in the community in different ways, and even started giving the khutbah and so forth, um, when you're a khatib, people come after the khutbah and some oftentimes ask questions. It's important for the khatib or any person, any of us, to recognize our limitations. As one of the righteous has said, Rahimallahu imra'an arifa qadra nafsi wa waqafa indah. That it may Allah's mercy be on a person that understands their limitations, their capacities, and they stop where they know they need to stop. Right? So it's important for the person that's, um, that's being asked as well as the one who's asking to have knowledge of what they're doing. For the one who's being asked, that's out of my scope. I can't speak to that. And for the one who's asking to recognize, not any person who speaks and he says, Qala Allah wa qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is qualified to be able to give fatwa, to be able to give people direction, religious direction and opinions as to how to live their life. Right. So that's very important. So anyways, going back to my story, um, people would come and they would ask questions. And I, with my little no, limited knowledge, having read some material, studied a little bit, you know, was, was kind of quick to answer. But then years later, fast forward years later, went overseas and studied and, you know, did my bachelor's degree in Sharia and, and all of these things, people would come and ask me the same question. I said, no, just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm afraid to answer. Go ask Sheikh Mustafa. Right? And, and that's, 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 how, that's how we have to deal with our deen, with this level of uh, integrity, with this level of, um, you know, of hesitation, of just simply throwing out opinions about what Islam is and what Islam says, and especially when it comes to halal and haram. In the Sahaba, they were that, they were that way, to the point where it was said to one of the tabi'een, he said to, to, the, you know, to the other people with him, he said, you all are so quick to answer questions when people, and these are people of knowledge. These are people of great knowledge. People who have memorized the Quran, people who have extensive knowledge of the Sunnah. These are people, these, these are the conversations they're having. You all are so quick to answer the questions of people. If this same mas'ala, if the same issue came up at the time of Sayyidina Umar, he would have gathered the people of Badr. And then they would have come up with a verdict, with a fatwa to fit the situation. When uh, after the Sahaba, 
You have so many examples of how our scholars, they navigated this very lofty responsibility. They would, uh, they would come to Imam Malik and ask him questions. It's mentioned by one that there was one man who came and he asked Imam Malik 48 different questions. And out of 32 of those 48 questions, you know what his answer was? La adri. I don't know. He says, I came to you, Imam Malik, from the other side of the world to ask you these questions. Because you're the, supposedly the man with the most knowledge that is alive today. He says, I can't tell you anything. La adri. I don't know. I don't have that. I have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of just saying, you know, what, what I think without having a deeper introspection, without having an all-encompassing you know, picture of what this issue looks like. So in today's world, what about us? What about us today? Right? If this was the way of, of how the, the, the Prophet ﷺ himself, the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala Alayhim Ajma'in, may Allah be pleased with them all, with the scholars that came after, Rahimallahu Ta'ala, all of these incredible people, if this is how they navigated life's challenges and difficulties, when they were the learned people, if this is how they navigated things, then what about us? What is our responsibility? You know, these are people, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ulama Waratatul Anbiya. The scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. The Prophets have the have have knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to speak to a certain extent even. And the, the scholars they uh, inherit that reality. If that's their charge. What is our responsibility today as average Muslims living in society trying to navigate all of these different things that come up uh, in our lives, all of these different realities that unfold in front of our eyes, the changing how, we, how uh, society sees gender and how um, the different financial transactions, cryptocurrency and all of these different developments that take place in the business world, all sorts of new developments that take place in the world, what do we do? How do we navigate? So number one, it's important that if this was the way in which the righteous before us, the righteous and the learned before us navigated, then we have to be very conscious and careful about how we navigate our deen, how we negotiate our deen. Do we simply go on Google and type in what does Islam say about cryptocurrency and then just from any random um, uh, website and we have no idea who is behind that, what the source of that is, what is their belief system even, what is their aqidah. There are, you know, in the Sunni Muslim community, we go back to our sources. You go on the internet and you plug in so much of what comes up first are from a whole other perspective. So how do we navigate that? Do we, just, do we just, like we said, go onto Google and pop in a question? Do we just simply ask, you know, our family members or the elder in our family? Or do we go to people that have the knowledge to speak on these matters? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Go and ask the people of knowledge if indeed you do not know. So it's very important for us as Muslims today that we take our deen seriously, we take our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seriously, and we don't simply try to navigate our deen and act based on some very surface level, very flimsy, non-grounded, non-founded sort of information or understandings or research even. If we want to be serious about our deen, then we are very conscious and careful about where we pull our information from, right? about where we get our information from. You know, recently a question came to me, and it was a sister, 
And she said, uh, Sheikh, um, we're, my friend and I are having a debate about prayer. I said, okay, tell me about it. And she says, well, I think that, you know, um, when I am on my menses, that I should, I should continue my prayer because I, this is, you know, I, I'm worshiping Allah. And, and, and so it's very interesting that people's understandings of some basic elements of the deen can be very off. Because why? Because they haven't, they haven't taken the time to ask, right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, indeed, the, uh, the cure for ignorance is the question. If you don't ask, you will never learn. As, as some, one of the righteous ones said, that two type of people never learn. They will never gain knowledge. They will never increase themselves in knowledge. Num number one, al-mutakabbir, al the person who's arrogant. I already know everything. I don't need to ask you anything. Grand Sheikh, who are you? Right? I already know everything. And the second one is al-mustahi, uh, the person who's too shy. Right? And, and they're too shy to ask. Our responsibility is to ask, is to learn, is to seek knowledge and to seek it from the right sources so that we practice our deen correctly so that we when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can say ya Allah I lived my life the way you wanted me to live I did what you wanted me to do I practice my deen the way in in a way in which pleases you when I didn't know I asked people of knowledge because they know better than me Rather than just, you know, well, you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now you are going to be taking account for this, 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 and this, and this. Why? Because you just said, well, you know, I, this, is, this, this seems like an easier course or an easier way of doing things. This makes sense to me, right? And of course, Islam makes sense, but sense or common sense is not the the ultimate deciding factor in a matter. There's a subjectivity to that. And there's a way in which the scholars, that they extract knowledge so as to be able to guide people how to live their life. And there's a whole process, this is a whole massive field of study, the study of usul al-fiqh, the foundational elements of juris jurisprudence, the study of fiqh, and so and on and on. Right? So it's important that we as Muslims living today in today's world, more so than any other time before, where ignorance is much more prevalent, even though information is much more available, unfortunately on certain levels, ignorance is much, is much more pre uh, prevalent because people go to any random place by which to seek that knowledge. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in our path of seeking uh, correct and sound knowledge and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, to help us in practicing our deen in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Shazakum Allah khayyam, Shaykh Suhail. I'll ask Shaykh Mustafa Umar inshaAllah ta'ala to take the podium for his part of the presentation inshaAllah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah wa ba'ah. So I've been uh, tasked with addressing a few particular issues to build upon what Sheikh Sohail has already mentioned. The first one is, do we need to follow a madhab or a school of thought? So let me just understand my audience very quickly. How many of you have heard the word madhab before? How many of you are aware of this term? Okay, a lot of you, mashallah. How many of you have ever been told that you need to follow a madhab? How many? Oh, quite a significant number, about half the audience. Okay, so what happens is, what is a madhab? A madhab is what's called a school of thought, or it's a way of looking at Islamic law. And it's a way of looking at the Qur'an and looking at the hadith, and you interpret a verse of the Qur'an, or you interpret a hadith according to a particular way in which uh, not everyone is going to look at every single word the exact same way. So what happens is, if you go into an Islamic university, or even if you go into a high school level program, you're going to find two approaches to studying Islamic law. So if you take Islamic law, the word, the word is fiqh usually. 
It means sharia or fiqh. Fiqh is the study of Islamic law. So if you go in and you enroll yourself into a program, you're going to have either a book or you're going to have a class. And they're going to teach fiqh or Islamic law either according to one of two approaches. Approach number one will be through a madhab. Uh, what, what are the madhabs? There's a Hanafi school, a Shafi'i school, a Maliki school, a Hanbali school. There are four main primary widespread madhabs in the world. So what's going to happen is, if you go into a curriculum where they're teaching the Hanafi school, and when you're praying and you say, Allahu Akbar, where are your hands going to be when you hold your hands for men? They're going to be below your navel. And if you learn according to the Shafi'i, Happen, they're going to be above the navel. And when you go down into ruku and you go down into bowing position, you're going to add an extra hands going up Shafi school. And if you follow the Hanafi school or if you're taught the Hanafi school, the hands don't go up. You go straight into ruku. So there's going to be some small differences here. And what ends up happening is whichever school you end up joining or whichever book you end up buying to teach you, you're either going to get a book according to one of these four schools, and this has become very And it's important for you to understand why. Why would somebody have a particular school? Why does this, why does this curriculum have to have a Hanafi school or a Shafi'i school or a Maliki school or something like that? What's the point of that? Well, there's a reason. The reason is because when you're studying Islamic law, there's a lot of benefits to make sure that you're being trained in a way where people around you in the same school, they're not just going to be choosing random opinions all over the place, but rather you have one particular approach to studying Islamic law. So you're going to find that historically, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 700 years ago, 900 years ago, this became a very famous and popular way for people to study Islam, Islamic law, fiqh. Whenever you go to a school, they're going to identify which madhab they are studying. So this is one approach to studying Islamic law. The second approach to studying Islamic law is to say, we don't follow any madhab at all. In fact, we don't even believe in madhabs. These madhabs, these are all just made up schools. We shouldn't follow any of them. We follow directly from the Quran and from the Hadith. So we're not going to teach you what did Imam Abu Hanifa from the Hanafi school say. We're not going to teach you what Imam Malik from the Maliki school said. We're going to teach you just only what the Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught. So every single time you learn the rule, we're going to put a hadith there. These are two ways of studying Islam. And within the two ways, there became two extreme approaches. The first extreme approach when it came to a madhab, it began by people saying, when you study a book, you must pick a madhab. You pick the Shafi'i school, and you pick the Hanafi school, or you pick the Maliki school, and you must stick to that school no matter what, and you never ever leave that school. And if you ever have a question about Islam, you have to go and find. If you're a Shafi'i, you identify as Shafi'i, I hate the word identify due to the LGBT thing. But, but anyways, you, 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 you studied, you, 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 you consider yourself to be the Maliki Madhab or whatever. You must find a scholar that follows that particular Madhab and you must ask them, what is the Maliki opinion on this particular issue? Now, and they say, if you don't, and you see another opinion or you ask another sheikh and they give you another answer, you're following your desires because you left your own school and you're just picking whatever you want. It's like fatwa shopping, like it's some kind of store. You just go with whatever is the best price. This is one extreme approach. And the reason why it happened is because scholars at some point hundreds of years ago, they saw people doing exactly this. They were fatwa shopping. So they would go to one scholar and they'd say, you know what? What's the ruling on dog saliva? I encounter a lot of dogs, or I like playing with dogs. And the Shafi'i scholar is going to say, you must wash off the dog saliva seven times with water and one time with dirt or soap. Every single time, even a little tiny bit of dog saliva comes to you. And even if the dog brushes against you or something like that, you have to go clean your pants 
and you can't just put take them to the dry cleaners and you can't just put them in the washing machine you need to wash them seven times and you say this is really tough I'm looking for something a little bit easier let me go and ask somebody else and you ask the other shit hey that was a tough answer what's your opinion on dog saliva and they give you another answer the Hanafi school will say oh you only need to wash it three times and you say oh I like that one it's much easier you say, but maybe there's an easier one. Let me go and ask somebody else. And you keep on asking and asking and asking, and then you're hoping to find an answer that basically gives you the absolute easiest thing. Five minutes? <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to speed this up then. Time just got cut in half. All right, so, so you do all of that, and you're basically trying to get something that's the easiest for you. What are you supposed to be doing as a Muslim? What you're supposed to be doing is you're supposed to be trying to do what you think Allah and His Messenger really intended and really wanted. That should always be the case. So the, the view was, if you leave your madhab for any reason, you must be following your desires automatically. And that, is, that became one extreme view in the group of people who say you must follow a madhab. Then the second view, is that we don't need these madhabs and we don't, who, who's, who's Abu Hanifa and Shafi and Malik? Who are these people? We only do what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We only care about these human beings. What do they know? And the problem with that approach, that approach is, is you're learning hadith, you're learning Quran, but the problem with the approach is we don't care what anybody has said for 1400 years. We're starting fresh. We're going to look ourselves at what the Quran says. We don't need tafsir. Look at the, what the hadith says. We don't need interpretations of any of these people. They're all human beings. We're human beings. If you look at any subject, does anyone approach a subject like that? If you look at medicine, let's say we, we you know, some doctors in the audience, right? Somebody breaks their arm, right? Should we look at 1400 years of what have, what have doctors said throughout history and they built upon, you know, they've dealt with a million broken arms. What did all these doctors say? So, you know, we don't, who are these doctors? They're human beings, we're human beings, forget all that. We're going to experiment from scratch. We're going to look at your arm directly. And I don't care what all the intellectual history of medicine has said. All that needs to be thrown away. I'm smart enough to figure this out on my own. I'm going to look at this arm and figure it out by myself. That's not the way medicine works. That's not the way law works. That's not the way history works. That's not the way philosophy works. That's, that's not the way any subject works. So it became an extreme where the second extreme on this side became we're going to ditch and throw away the entire intellectual legacy and history of Muslims for 1400 years. And Muslims were very clever. They're, they're known to be throughout history. Other societies were not as, even as clever as Muslims at all. So these are two really extreme approaches. And what we need to do is we need to make sure we don't go into any of these extremes, but we're somewhere in the middle. So I'm just going to summarize that. Uh, what about um, this idea of Googling fatwas and stuff like that? Well, we need to be careful for two reasons. Number one, the context matters very much. So if you go on a website, you know, or you go to Google, or even if you go on a website, islamqa.com.org.net, whatever it is, you know, there's, they're fighting over domains, I'm not going to get into that. And you type something in there, you see an answer. That answer might have been written in Sudan, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Iran, or in some other context. And it doesn't necessarily apply in your context. So you say, okay, we're going to a scholar, we're going to someone who's knowledgeable, we're going to somebody who knows what they're talking about. But do you know the context in which it was said? Number one. Number two, is this the only scholar that has answered this question? I mean, is there a reason to go and ask somebody else? So I'm going to quote you a fatwa from the Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. Sheikh al-Islam Hussein from the Ottoman Empire was asked the question, and this is in his fatwa collection, multi-volume fatwa collection. He said, Zayd is drunk. Not a good Muslim officer. Zayd gets drunk, and he divorces his wife with a triple divorce. According, this is a Hanafi uh, scholar, Ottoman Empire, the Turks were Hanafis. 
So he says, according to the Hanafi school, this is going to count despite the fact that he was drunk. After daybreak, he's sober again. He has a hangover, whatever it is. And now he denies that he ever pronounced talaq to his wife. But his wife, Hind, is unable to prove that she remembers him making the triple divorce. So the question that the lady asked, this is a real question. What is the way for Hind to save herself from zina? Because from the wife's perspective, Hind's perspective, she got divorced, triple divorced, despite the fact that the guy was drunk. But now he's denying him and say, I didn't do that. She said, between me and Allah, this guy is not my husband anymore. So if I'm continuing to live with him, this is haram. This is zina. So I need to do something. So what do I do? So Shaykh al-Islam, his response was, if no other means of escape is possible, it is allowed to add poison to Zaid's food. <laughs> and you kill him. <laughs> now, sisters, please don't take this fatwa home. Okay? Is this from a legitimate scholar? Absolutely. This is the Shaykh al-Islam, the top scholar in the Ottoman Empire. And he's saying you could put poison in his food. And do you know why they said that? Because he's assuming a situation which you're probably not in. The assumption is that this guy is a tyrannical husband. I mean, he's getting drunk. Something's wrong. It's, your, your husband's probably not in this category. He's getting drunk. The woman, he's denying now that he ever made the pronouncement. The woman has a sense of taqwa and she's like, I, I can't be with this guy anymore. I, and I follow strictly the Hanafi madhab. And there's nobody else to ask. The Ottoman Empire, Hanafi madhab was spread across the board. This was what she had available to her. This is before internet and all that. It's hundreds of years ago. And then she's saying that, you know what? This guy is going to keep me stuck inside the house. And he's going to try to approach me the next day. And I don't want to do anything that is haram. But if I do something to this guy, I'm going to be in trouble. Not just in front of Allah. I'm going to be in trouble. How do I say myself? I'm going to be in trouble with the law. Because the rule on killing, according to the Hanafi Madhab is, if you commit murder and you kill somebody, what is the potential punishment back for you. Qisas, retaliation, you will be killed unless they forgive. So if, if I kill this husband of mine, okay, I'm not trying to give you ideas here, but if I kill this husband of mine, they might end up killing me, so I'll be dead. So how do I get out of this? Well, in the Hanafi school, they have two different types of murder. So if you kill somebody with, uh, you know, with, with, let's say you go and you shoot somebody and you're trying to shoot them in the leg, Again, please don't take this as a tutorial, okay? Scenario. You try and shoot someone, say, I just want to shoot him in the leg. And you accidentally, you miss. The gun misfires, shoots him in the heart, and he dies. But you can prove that my intention was to just get him in the leg. This is going to be called qatlul khata, an accidental murder, right? But it's going to be in the category of qatl shibhamd, which means a, a semi-intentional murder. So you use the weapon that would normally kill people, but you didn't intend to kill them and they ended up dying. But then there's another type of thing. If somebody comes and says, you take a pencil and you say, I just wanted to poke this person. You accidentally poke them in the heart and they died. Does a pencil normally kill people? No. Let's say you just push someone accidentally. He fell, his hit, head hit a rock and the guy died somehow. And you're like, I just, I just wanted to push you gently and accidentally you fell and you died. Will you be killed in retaliation? No. So according to the Hanafi school, if you put poison in somebody's food, you will not be subject to retaliation penalty. So this mufti, this Shaykh al-Islam is giving a fatwa based upon what he thinks this woman's circumstance is in order for her to save herself from zina, in order for maybe this guy's going to come and attack her. And there's no other way that she can somehow get out of this. Now imagine you Google that fatwa and all of a sudden it comes up and you're like, man, my husband, <laughs> this is the only way to, for me to do, I'm going to follow. This is Shaykh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> Sorry, hubby, <laughs> poison in your food. No. So obviously the Shaykh al-Islam came later. Shaykh Abu Saud, one of the great scholars, came back and said, no, no, you go to the Qadi. Go to the judge and you ask them to separate the two. There's a way out of this. There's a whole article on this, by the way. It's, uh, it's in the Journal of Islamic Law and Society by a non-Muslim called Colin Imber. It's called Why You Should Poison Your Husband. And it gives you all the different fatwas in the Hanafi school. 
about the different fatwas that have been given by different scholars about poisoning your husband. Now, should you pick and choose what you want? Sisters, please don't pick and choose on this one. Number one. Number two, should you follow the first fatwa that you come across, depending on your context and your circumstance? This is not the way things work, right? So we should be very cautious, we should be very careful, and we should realize that there is a criteria of training for a mufti. So there's one aspect of you need to be careful about what type of fatwas, what type of a fatwa is an answer by a religious scholar. What type of fatwas you're going to be taking, number one. And number two, be very careful who you ask to. This is an exception to the rule where the scholar gave kind of a strange answer here. But you know what's even stranger? You have a question about Islamic law and you go, oh, I'm just going to ask my friend. Does your friend know anything? Uh, you know, he prays. Like, oh, he prays. MashaAllah. So he had, he, has he read the entire Quran? Uh, not really. Does he know Arabic? Uh, not really. Does he read tafsir? Has he done any of these studies? Has he done any training whatsoever? If you do that, you're basically saying, you know what? If you have some major problem, let's say you have, you, you, break, your, you break your leg, you have a sprained ankle. Do you just go to your random friend and you'd be like, hey, can you tell me what to do with my ankle? And he goes, you know, I recommend you just drink some coffee and you walk it off. No, you go to somebody who actually has training, who is a doctor, who is a you know, physician, and how many years have they trained for? How many, how many years does it take for you to become a qualified physician? It takes like eight years, 10 years of training. And then you can go and they're still a beginner, and then they need 10 years of experience, and then you say, oh, this is a doctor. If you needed a surgery, would you just go to some random person, hey, listen, look, look, check this out. Listen, I got my, here's my, uh, Here's my pocket knife. Just, just handle my arm. I got a little problem in my arm. Just, just cut it up. Just, just handle it. Would you do that? No way. You say this person needs to have a proper scalpel. A laboratory needs to be, you know, done. All of that stuff needs to be taken care of. You need to go to an expert. So it's very important to do two things. Number one, choose the right person when it comes to who you're taking your knowledge from and your fatwa from. And number two, also, use a little bit common sense when you're getting an answer from somebody and you should ask somebody else who has knowledge if either the answer seems strange to you, not because you're trying to get what you want. Number two, if the answer they give you seems that they didn't really understand the scenario that you presented to them. And number three, you've lost, they've lost credibility in your eyes because of such a poor answer that they had given. This gives you a legitimate reason to ask another expert. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding of Islam. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh Mustafa. We've got a lot of ideas and insights on how to maybe harm our spouses. Uh, unfortunately, we'll conclude the session here and we'll see you all at Allah insha'Allah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashtu Allah ilaha 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 ilaha